Welcome back for more AP Biology. This time we're going to deal with some cellular, rest, er, cellular reproduction. And in particular, how do we know how chromosome numbers go along with cellular division? They do test you on this a little bit from the book. So it helps if we have a place as to where we've been and how things are integrating. So we started the year with dealing with statistics. From there, we dealt with a whole bunch of macroscopic ecology and natural selection, so evidence is for natural selection, how this would possibly work, which led to some questions about inheritance patterns and Mendel's laws, which brought us back to dealing with population genetics. From there, we went as far as we could, so we now had to talk about cells and how motion happens with cells and with organisms. And now we can talk about making those cells reproduce. So from yesterday, we dealt with the concept of a chromosome and with that concept of the chromosome, we know that somehow we go from one cell to another cell, we made more cells, and the information needs to move along. So we know that somehow there's replication occurring, even though we don't necessarily see it happening. When we look at bacteria or prokaryotic cells, what we notice is they kind of always look the same. It just goes from one cell that kind of then splits apart into two. And we call that binary fission but we don't really see any events going on. We don't see any big deals. We don't see any chromosomes. We don't see anything going on. It just goes from one, stretches out, and then you have two, which kind of is anticlimactic. If I look at a eukaryotic cell, especially one that's been stained so I can see the nucleus, that's not the pattern I see. This here turns out to be a slide of an allium root tip. Allium is an onion. So if you take a root of an onion, which is constantly growing, and slice it really thin and stain it with a stain that stains for chromatin, what I get is this pattern here. And what you notice is there's a whole bunch of black circles, but every once in a while we see those threads. We see chromosomes. We see chromatin. Logically, if I were to look at this, and if I were to assume that all of these are randomly spread out, it, would, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say, well, the percentage of these cells that are in each visible state is probably reflective of the time it takes in order to make a cell reproduce. Because if all, any of these could be reproducing, there must be some amount of time spent where they just are a big black blob, and then there must be a amount, certain amount of time spent to make them into the visible chromosomes, and there must be a spent amount of time or specific amount of time to line up all those chromosomes in the middle, and then there must be another amount of time to split them apart and then make the two cells. They're logically, that works. And then you would probably start again, thus implying that we're in a cycle, a cycle for the cell or a cell cycle. That is something we can logically infer from any of this stuff that we have here, assuming that they're all random. If they're not all random, a eh, different story. So depending on where we look, we end up getting two different things. And different biologists in the 1800s got two different answers. On the right, we actually have pictures from Walter Fleming, that, who we met yesterday. And we looked at some of those pictures actually in class. The other picture came from uh, Van Beneden. I can't remember his first name. Oh, uh, well, his name is Van Beneden. And he looked at a different organism and noticed not two cells forming, but he noticed that they split into four cells, thus begging the question of, well, how is that happening? What, what's going on here in order to make four cells? So clearly we have two different versions of the cell division thing going on. So let's look at them one at a time. So Fleming ended up giving us the term mitosis. And the thing with the term mitosis, it means the condition where I see threads because he saw threads, he saw the chromosomes. And if you were to follow the pattern of them, you can actually put them into a logical order, which is what you see here. There are names for it. We have since given names to each of these states, but that's not essential. We don't need that. What we have are distinct little steps. And in each of these little steps, something's going on with the chromosomes. We go from super condensed chromosomes to visible chromosomes, to chromosomes that we line up in the middle. We split them apart. We split apart the chromatids. And then we recondense it back into what looks like a nucleus. That entire process we just call mitosis. 
we go from one cell to two cells. And when you look at the cells, the first cell at the start looks just like the two cells at the end. Okay, well, we can animate it. This is gonna have a little bit more detail and it's gonna involve some proteins that we call microtubules. So as you look at this, the chromatin starts to condense. As it condenses, we're gonna start forming chromosomes, visible chromosomes. Those chromosomes are gonna be asked to move and the way they're gonna be asked to move is we're gonna use two different parts of the cells called the centrosomes. The centrosomes have things that we call centrioles and those turn out to be things that make microtubules. Those microtubules are gonna grab a hold of to the middle of the chromosomes. So here you see a chromosome with its two chromatids. It's gonna to attach to the centromere or the proteins around the centromere. When those microtubules grab a hold, they're gonna pull at equal strength. If you do that, we can align these chromosomes up into the center and then get a trigger to split them apart. When you do that, we have divided the cell in half, each getting the appropriate number of chromosomes onto each half. And again, we just call that entire process mitosis. They'll start to uncondense. As they start to uncondense, the cells are actually gonna split in half. Fancy word for seeing that little dent show up is called a cleavage or a cleavage furrow. And then we split the cell in half. Isn't that just amazing? When we look at this stuff, we can kind of infer that there was actually a replication that goes on because what went into each of those two cells was a single chromosome or what used to be chromatids. And what we know is if we kept watching that cell, eventually that X shaped shows up again. And that X shape with the two sister chromatids implies it replicated. For the sake of pointing it out, we have been to have two chromosomes that are the same type, meaning if I had two number one chromosomes or two number five chromosomes, they look the same, they're the same size, they have the same banding patterns, we call those homologous chromosomes, just for the sake of pointing it out. When we look at mitosis, what we ultimately get is we start with one chromosome, we imply that somehow it replicates to make that X shape, and then we split that chromosome apart, split apart the chromatids, and I get two cells that end up having the same chromosome as what we started. That's all that really happens in mitosis. If you want to learn that they have names, you can do that, but the names aren't that important. Around the exact same time as all of that was going on, Hetwig and Van Beneden, Edward, Edward, that's his name, they were looking at different cells and they were seeing a different pattern. Their, the cells that they were looking at did not do their specific pattern as often. So this was a far more specialized thing that they were noticing. But what they started to look at was the number of chromosomes at the start and at the end were different. We weren't resulting in the same thing. We were getting something different. And what they said was, oh, a meiosis is occurring. The term meiosis is actually an, it's an English word, and it means to be reduced or reduced status. So what do we notice? We go from four chromosomes to two chromosomes four individual types of chromosomes to two types of chromosomes. And when you do that, we have a reduction. We have a meiosis. So what we get, if I look at this picture, is on the far left side, I have two red chromosomes and two white chromosomes. Two of them are small, two of them are short. The two tall ones, we can call that chromosome one. The two short ones, let's call that chromosome number two. What we get as we move through this process, and if you look at the end, is we have one chromosome one and one chromosome two. Okay, so we got a haploid number. We got the complete set. We just don't have two sets. The only way this could make sense to us, the only way we can logically go from one to the half, is if the first thing we do is we take our homologous chromosomes and we split them apart. So that's step one is split apart homologous chromosomes and then we take those homologous chromosomes and we split apart the chromatids, just like we would in mitosis. 
the result of what you get is we can go from a diploid to a haploid. Step one, split apart homologous chromosomes. Step two, split apart the chromatids. If I do that, what I will always get are haploid cells. What does this look like? Excellent question, so glad you asked. Just like with mitosis, we're going to start to condense the chromosomes. The chromosomes are going to be paired up as homologous pairs, and when they're paired up as homologous pairs, There's a little bit of weirdness that goes on. We'll talk about this weirdness later. But we're going to take that homologous pair of chromosomes, and we're going to take the pair and line them up in the center. So they're somehow connected, and they line up the exact same way as they did in mitosis. But once we line them up in the middle, because that's how we know whether we can split them apart evenly, we'll split apart the pairs of chromosomes, and then what I'll do is do the exact same thing again, where in this particular case, I'm going to take my pairs of, or my chromosomes with my chromatids, and I'm going to rip apart the chromatids by aligning the chromosomes in the center. Once they're in the center, we can rip the chromatids apart. And now I happen to have four cells that are all haploid. That's meiosis. So meiosis seems to be mitosis with an additional step. What we happen to get in meiosis is we could explain some of Mendel's laws. We could actually, in a sense, explain his rule of independent assortment, meaning genes separate out. Because I don't know how those chromosomes were being twisted to be pulled apart. I don't know if only the paternal ones went one place and the maternal chromosomes went somewhere else, or if you, what matching, mixing and matching you got. It turns out Mendel's rules didn't explain everything. And these happen to be some data from two individuals, Bateson and Punnett, who were studying plants, not peas, so different plant, and they got numbers that didn't make sense to them. So they repeated one of Mendel's experiments, but they didn't use pea plants. And what they got were numbers that did not match an expected ratio that Mendel would have pointed out, which is a 9331. Instead, they got a 15.6 to 1 to 1.4 to 4.5 which is nothing close to a 9331. And what they came to the conclusion about was clearly something else is going wrong. The independent assortment rule is not applying here. Somehow it's not working. Because it seems that purple flowers and long pollen, which is one of the original parents, and the red flowers and the round pollen, which is one of the original parents, that seems to be far more plentiful ratio-wise than what we would expect. Somehow, it's almost as though they prefer to be purple and long or red and round, that those two want to be coupled together. And only periodically do we shuffle them back and forth. What well, turned out, an American named Thomas Hunt Morgan looked at these data and his own experiments and came to a conclusion that, well, maybe these genes aren't independently assorting because they're actually physically connected together. How would we know that? Well, they're, maybe they're on the exact same chromosome. Or maybe not only are they on the exact same chromosome, maybe they are really close to each other on the exact same chromosome. And something is happening on that chromosome that makes them every once in a while trade spots, especially if you happen to be in a heterozygous condition. That phenomenon we call crossing over or recombination. Since the early 1900s, around 
two or so, we actually figure out a mechanism for recombination or crossing over. And it happens when we take those homologous pairs of chromosomes and they get close to each other in the first part of meiosis. So if I take these two homologous chromosomes, the blue and the red, and bring them close to each other so that we can pull them apart in the first part of meiosis, the problem is they are the exact same. So they are composition-wise the same. The banding patterns would be the same. Their length is the same. All that's the same. The difference is their components, the chromatin, might be different versions of traits. They might have different alleles. That's not going to affect the overall structure. So what if, when they're close to each other, they tangle up and they accidentally snip off parts? Kind of like if you were to cross your legs, you're putting your right leg on the left side and your left leg on the right side. Well, what if you accidentally severed where they crossed and reattached them? So now your left leg was attached to your right thigh and your right leg, or your left leg is attached to your right thigh. That would be the concept of crossing over or a recombination. We are putting in a new shuffle of these traits. Why would we do this? Well, it turns out if we were to model out how independent assortment works with chromosomes, if you have two chromosomes, there's only two possible combinations. If you have Pardon me, if you have two chromosomes, you get four combinations of how you can pair things up. If I happen to have, especially in terms of meiosis, in terms of making going from diploid to haploid. So two chromosomes, I get four options. If I have one chromosome, I get two options. If I have three chromosomes, I get eight options. So I seem to be multiplying by two. Or I am two to the first, two to the second, two to the third, blah, blah, blah. If I happen to have 23 chromosomes, I have two to the 23rd different ways I can shuffle around those chromosomes so that I always have one through 23 inside of a cell. That turns out to be like one point, or probably 8.1 million different combinations. The problem is we have more than 8.1 million people. So after a while, this is, we're gonna start to get redundancies. So how can we increase the variety what if every time we were to do that shuffle, the ones that are to the first, to the second, to the third, what if during that shuffle, we also take the cards that we're shuffling, we cut them apart, and we reshuffle how we built the card? So we're recombining the cards themselves. The result of that becomes we don't have a couple million options. We might get a couple hundred million. We might get a couple billion different ways that we can combine these things. And the result of that is we have all of the variety we could ever possibly need for evolution. But even then, we could even add more variation on top of that.